Just let's just see if they're in the hallway. Probably got locked in a hallway, huh? <clears throat> See anybody? Nope. <laughs> I scared them away. Uh oh. How many have you been getting over there? They said uh, eight, nine or ten. Oh, okay. Oh, shoot, Jackie just logged out. Jackie said she wasn't getting audio. I mean, everybody else is, so I was trying to explain to her quickly to log out, log back in, or audio setup, setup wizard. wizard before she could let me <clears throat> run the setup wizard, she logged back out. Are they coming now? Okay, Bob, you 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 tell them where to sit. You're the you're the you're the executive co-executive producer here. Arlene was here. Luckily, I found someone who get me up here. Oh, I know. I came in the back door. It was open. But how'd you get up the fourth floor? The Walk. stairs? Oh, I didn't. I didn't the know stairs where the back. stairs were. I oh. usually took the elevator. Oh, and I always come like, in that back door over here, and okay. the stairs are right there. Okay, let's rock and roll. I don't know if there's other stairs besides those. Yeah. 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 If they have any extra, they can function it down here. Like my term, that functions. All right, I will press the record button here. If you have anything to add. All right. Okay, here we go. Ready to go. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Live from North Dakota State University, this is the third session of the Spring Fever Garden Forums. I'm Tom Call from the Department of Plant Sciences, and I'm here with Bob Birch and Scott Swanson from Agricultural Communications. The Spring Fever Garden Forums is where we connect you, the gardener, with the researchers and educators from North Dakota State University. And our format is a simple one. We ask for a 20 minute presentation on a timely topic. And then we follow this up with your questions and we encourage your questions. Everybody who's on Blackboard Collaborate has the opportunity to type in your questions in the chat box and you do that. And then I as the moderator will read that question to our speaker. So let's get started right now. We've got a full slate of presentations tonight. We're gonna start talking flowers and especially annuals. And I love annuals because you just plant them in the ground in May and they bloom all summer and into the fall. Can't go wrong. Perennials, they just give you a few weeks, but annuals all summer long, bright colors. And here to tell us about some of the top performers of the NDSU trial garden program is Barb Lashkowitz, a research specialist. Barb? Thank you very much, Tom. Yep, I'm going to talk about mostly All-America Selections tonight. We're an official All-America Selection display garden at NDSU. And every year I get fresh seed from the current year plus the previous four years. So I'm going to talk about those that have been All-America Selections from 2012 until 2016. And for those of you that don't know what All-America Selection is, it's a nonprofit organization that tests vegetables and flowers across the United States. It's typically been seed started um, plants, but they have gotten into cutting vegetatively propagated annuals, and they're also starting some perennials. So in a couple years, we'll be seeing perennials that have the All America Selection designation on them. So the first one I'm gonna talk about is Angelonia Serenita Pink. This is also called Summer Snapdragon, and it's just a very tough performer, somewhat drought tolerant. It is listed as a plant that's tolerant or will kind of detour rabbits and deer from browsing. However, the first year I planted Angelonia, I had like a vole or something mow down all the plants, so clearly not 
unedible for the flowers, but it came back so nicely over the course of the summer that I, I really couldn't believe it. Just was a very nice, bushy plant. Okay, there's been a couple cannas, but the most recent is Canna South Pacific Scarlet. This is a seed started canna, and it's a pretty orangey red color. And despite the fact that it's seed started, it still gets about three to four feet in the garden. So it's still a real showy, tropical looking plant. And it will produce roots that you can store, although oftentimes the seed started cannas will not produce fleshy enough roots to store, but this canna, you certainly can, and it's done very well in the gardens. Okay, Dianthus Jolt Pink was from last year, and the key to this Dianthus is that it won't stop blooming in the heat of the summer, and a lot of times Dianthus, they're more cool season bloomers. This one stays through the heat of the summer. It's also nice for cutting flowers for those of you who like to have flowers that you can bring in doors. Okay, echinacea, and I know I was gonna talk about annuals, and this clearly is a perennial, but if we start it early enough, we can get this to bloom the first year, and you have to start the seed of this by January 25th, January 30th, by the end of January at least, to get it to produce bloom. And the unique thing about Cheyenne Spirit is the different colors that it has. It doesn't have just the pink, as you can see here, it has oranges and kind of salmony, white, a wide range of colors. It is supposed to be hardy to zone four, but my experience with some of these odd colored echinacea is that they do winter kill, but certainly you could keep it in the ground and see if it does come back for you each year. Okay, Gora Sparkle White, and I just really love this plant. I, it was an All America selection, I believe from 2013. I have to start it a little earlier in the spring. I think I started about February, <clears throat> but it gets to be a big, nice, bushy plant. And for those of you familiar with Gora, they get these wands of flowers that have really nice movement in the wind. And they're also very drought tolerant. So if you like low maintenance gardening, this is really a good one for that. It's a native to Texas. So if that tells you anything, we all, Texas is a big state, I know, but there's some rough areas. so. That's a good, tough plant to grow. Geranium, this is Pinto Premium White to Rose because as it opens, it's white and then it kind of turns into this rose color. Very good performer on the right is the All America Selection picture on the left is how it performed in the gardens last year. It says you don't have to deadhead this because the new blooms will cover up the old blooms, but I think with a lot of geraniums, you still want to deadhead them to keep them looking neat, but certainly you don't have to deadhead this one to keep it in a nice bloom. <coughs> now, these two geraniums are going to be seen this summer. They're 2016 All-America selections, Brocade Cherry Night and Brocade Fire. <coughs> These are not seed started geraniums. These are vegetatively propagated. So I haven't even got the plants yet. They haven't sent them to me. But the unique thing with these is the foliage. And if you look at Brocade Cherry Night, it's got that really deep chocolatey foliage. And then Brocade Fire has the chocolate with the wide green margin and then those bright orange flowers. So kind of anxious to get these in and see how they do for us this year. Impatience. New Guinea Florific Sweet Orange, and this was a couple years ago. And for me, this one has not done well, and I think I just, in the spot that I grow it, it's a little too dry and not fertile enough for it. It does have that really unique kind of bicolored salmon flower. And then it does, New Guineas will take a little bit more sun than regular impatience, so if you have a bed that's like maybe sunny in the morning and shady in the afternoon, that would probably tolerate that a little bit more, although you'd like to give it a little more water with the higher sunlight. Okay, now the next two impatience, Bounce Pink Flame and Sun Patient Spreading Shell Pink. These are also vegetatively propagated impatients, and these impatients are resistant to the downy mildew that's been killing the impatience Wallariana across the country. These are both hybrids, as you can see here, um, and they will take more sun, 
than the other impatience as well. The picture on the left again is from the gardens last year. The picture on the right is supplied by All America Selections. The bounce series gets its name because if it does get a little dry, they kind of wilt, but as soon as you water them, they bounce back and that's how they get their name. And then the Sun Patient Spreading Shell Pink, again, the picture on the right is All America Selections photo. Picture on the left shows them how they did in the gardens last year. And again, most this bed got full sun or sun most of the day and they did very well and had a really nice kind of light pink color to them. So I also don't have these plants yet because they'll be sending them vegetatively, hopefully soon. Okay, there's been a couple ornamental peppers as well. Black olive on the left. You can see the very small black peppers that turn red. And then New Mex Easter, which is a lot more showy, it gets these, you know, Easter egg colored peppers that go from a lavender to a yellow to a bright orange. Very showy. New Mex Easter is a smaller plant. It only gets about 10 inches. Black olive should get about 10 to 24. These will always do better in warmer weather. And they're very hot. So they are edible, but they're almost, well, I guess it depends on if you like spicy or not. Um, you can harvest them if you do like really spicy stuff. And then in 2016, they have black hawk coming out. And again, very similar to black olive where you get these deep black olives that will gra gradually turn red by the end of the summer. Osteospermum, Aquila daisy white, is from a couple years ago. And it's got that very pretty daisy-like flower with a lighter center to it. And this one also should be more more better. It should be better at blooming in the heat of the summer where some of the other osteospermums tend to go into like a little bit of a lull. I still find that this one has some inconsistencies with the bloom, but certainly if you like that big daisy-like flower, it's a very nice addition to the garden. Penstemon arabesque red. This is not a perennial here. I believe it's to zone six only. Two years we've been growing this. I'm really pleased with the flower production. It attracts hummingbirds and pollinators with that very tubular flower. Very showy. It just, it does need to be deadheaded. So for those of you that maybe don't like to do a lot of work in the garden, you maybe don't want to do this one because it does need that deadheading to keep it looking clean and to kind of promote more flowers. But I was really pleased the last couple of years with it. And then lots of petunias with the All America selection. We have African Sunset on the left and Trilogy Red on the right. Now African Sunset is kind of a unique salmony, orangey color, and they kind of touted it for using in school colors if you have orange and black or that sort of thing. And you can see, again, these are in the gardens two years ago. That's how well it did, just very, it's called a mounding spreading petunia because it's not supposed to get that dead center that a lot of petunias do. And then Trilogy Red on the right is more of a compact mounder, just with that very unique red color. And then Tidal Wave Red Velour. There's a couple of velour colors now that just have that deep velvety color to them. And the Tidal Waves are hedgeflores, so they will go four to five feet in all directions if you let them. You really need to have a larger spot in your garden for this particular petunia. And the petunias with their constant bloom are a little bit heavy feeders. So if you find that they're not doing as well for you, you might want to think about fertilizing them a little more often and making sure they're in a nice, rich soil. Okay, the Salvia Summer Jewel Series. There's four colors here that have been recent All-America selections. There's white, red, pink, and then in 2016, we have lavender, which is in the center of your screen. And the unique thing about this salvia is it's compact habit. So it's about 20 inches tall. Another plant that attracts the pollinators, so if you like the bumblebees and the hummingbirds to come in, this is a really good one for that. I like to deadhead it a little bit at the end of the season. It kind of gets a little um, dull with the older flower heads. I don't think you need to do that, but I just find it cleans it up a little bit. But otherwise, they're just really good performers. And then the Vincas, this one's Jams and Jelly Blackberry. And it's just got that real unique dark purple. They, they say sometimes it looks black, but the picture on the right kind of shows more true to what the color is. Picture on the left was supplied by All America Selections, and that does show that deep purple color. But in the garden, I find it's more of just a, a nice 
lavender without that black coloration. And vincas are great for drought tolerance. If you have a hot, sunny spot, they really love that um, low maintenance environment. And then the last All America selection I have are some zinnias. Um, we have Profusion Double Deep Salmon on the left and Profusion Double Hot Cherry on the right. And these are hybrids and they're a little bit less susceptible to powdery mildew that we see on the zinnia elegans. And these are just prolific bloomers. They're like little shrubs of color. And I really, the only problem I have with them is that we have white mold in our soil. So I have to be careful about that showing up, but otherwise I haven't seen really a, a whole lot of problems with these. So those are the All America selections and I just have a few more I wanted to mention um, that have done well. And the first one is the Begonia, the Baby Wing series. And the Baby Wing series has been around for a while. We had white in the trials about 10 years ago. And the nice thing about these is that they're very low maintenance and they tolerate dry shade very well. Then they've got kind of the mini um, dragon wing leaves to them. Pink by color and red are two new colors to the series, but you can see both those pictures are from the beds last year and especially pink by color did really well. And anything that's really low maintenance, I, I love. So Calibrachoa kabloom is, I'm mentioning it because Calibrachoa typically is vegetatively propagated. This is a seed started series. So we're getting new colors where you can get the seed and start them yourself. Calibrachoa are a little higher maintenance. They like higher fertilizer. You have to have a really good drainage, full sun. So they have not done well and I'm not, it's, I probably need to fertilize them more, a little higher maintenance, but I just wanted to mention them because of this new seed series that we're seeing. Canna Canova, wonderful cannas. Again, it's a seed started canna that's been specifically bred for northern climates. So it tolerates the shorter days, the less sun that we have up here. And again, they're started from seed, but these plants will get three to four feet tall in a season. And they do produce roots that are strong enough to store over winter as well, but very easy to start from seed. And there's a whole series, there's yellow, pink, red shades. And I think I have a mango this year and another one. So exciting to see that again for those big tropical flowers that you might like. Whoops, Celosia Arabona Red came out a couple years ago and just, I can't say enough good things about this. Bright color, healthy, um, uniform, very nice. It would probably dry well if you like to dry flowers, but I mean, you can just see from the picture how bright, if you like those warm colors, this is a great one. Euphorbia glamour, and now euphorbia is typically something that we see vegetatively propagated, but this is a seed started when there's glitz and glamour that are newer. And it's like a baby's breath filler. You see this in pots a lot, very easy to start. I just started mine about a week ago and they're already growing and they're so simple to start and you get this nice, I mean, they just, again, this is one that I just really loved last year. Nasturgeum Phoenix. I just love this flower, that bright orange split petal look, and it'll really fill in as a ground cover, very easy to grow and also edible for those of you who like to eat your flowers. And then to finish up, how about that under 20 minutes? We do have a website for the gardens on campus, the NSU Horticulture Gardens, which are on the west side of campus that are open anytime. But I put a report together on the bedding plant trials and if you want to access the previous year's notes, I take height and spread, any disease problems, that sort of thing. It's right there up on your screen. And it also talks about the other beds we have in the garden as well. That's all I have. So we can take questions. Okay, thank you, Barbara. That's great. Uh, let's have some questions out there in the audience. We welcome your questions. Now's the time for it. While we wait for those questions, so you said that research and demonstration garden, it's open anytime it is. to anybody? You don't yep. have a guard dog there chasing us out? We don't. And if anybody wants tours, they can, tours. we can take them on a tour. Otherwise, they can wander through at their leisure. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a question here from Fargo. I'm wondering which of those plants are the most deer resistant? Okay, please repeat the question. 
She's wow. wondering which one of those plants is the most deer resistant. Yeah, I don't know. Really, it depends on how hungry the deer are. I have a bigger problem with jackrabbits out there. Mm -hmm. um, the only one that I talked about that mentioned resistance to deer was the angelonia. But um, like I said, there was something that ate the angelonia. So if they're hungry, they'll eat anything. Okay, Barb, how about, uh, how can you prevent that white mold from taking over your garden? Oh. Sclerotinia, is that right? Yeah. Sclerotinia, white mold? I'm sure. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. It's tough because it gets in the soil, it persists for up to 10 years. There are some new fungicides on the market that I have not yet tested. It's, I mean, rotate your crops if you're getting it so that you don't keep zinnias always in that one spot because they're really susceptible to it. Right, the zinnias, so. you've had the most problem with them. So yes, yep, absolutely. Be careful with that. Mm -hmm. um, do, do any of the plants take part shade? Do any of the plants take part shade? Well, certainly the New Guinea patients will take part shade. Almost everything else is going to do better in full sun. Actually, the geraniums, those two vegetatively propagated ones that I don't have yet, they're listed as tolerant to partial shade, which kind of surprised me because I don't think of a geranium as a shady plant, but we'll see. How about, you know, you talked about some 2016 All-American selections. Yes. So is that your own private stock of seed or can other people buy those selections? They, they've changed. It used to be All-America selections would give all their display gardens the new seeds and then they wouldn't be available till the following year. But now they've changed that about three or four years ago where stuff that's new this year should be available to the home gardener. I'm not saying it is, but they're making it available as much as they can. And when you go to that All America Selections website, they have seed sources listed they do. For, uh, yeah. for, for their winter so you can follow the trail. Also, there's a magical tool called Google. So if you just type that in, that can lead yep. you to some seed catalogs. Mm -hmm. How about, where's a good place to get the seeds for those canines that you talked about? Well, I get them from the actual breeder. So I would say, again, go to Google. Yeah. Um, there's a couple seed companies. I use Park Seed, Thompson & Morgan, um, Burpee, that may have them, but again, it's going to have to look and see. What was that new color for the salvia in 2016? It's a lavender, lavender, which is a new color for that whole salvia species. Uh, what's the size of Glamour Euphorbia? The size of the Glamour Euphorbia, it got about 10 inches, 10 to 12 inches high, kind of just spilled over for me where okay. I had it growing. How about what does it mean to be vegetatively propagated? Easy for me to say, vegetatively propagated. <laughs> that means that if you produce seed, <clears throat> you don't get the same quality, so they take stem cuttings typically so that they can maintain the same quality of plants. So that's what vegetatively propagated is. Yeah, so there's no seeds involved, whereas, you know, sexual propagation. Right. This is an adult audience tonight, so we can talk a little <laughs> bit like that. The sexual propagation has to do with seeds. Okay, so how about is the jams and jellies blackberry vinca susceptible to powdery mildew? Mm. I have not seen powdery mildew on that. I see aster yellows on the vinca, which is kind of, it's a funny disease. It kind of blows in with the wind because the leaf hoppers spread it. You'll get one plant that looks yellowish and funny and the buds are, are goofy. So you need to pull that plant out. It also hits petunias and marigolds, but the powdery mildew I've not seen affecting that. Okay. Um, you mentioned a lot about the All America Selections winners. Are they usually available at a garden center? Is there a way to to find an All America Selections, like their distinctive logo, maybe? Or? Yep, their logo. If you're looking in seed catalogs, that logo will be there. And I guess you just need to talk to your local nurseries to see if they have them in stock. And there's another question about deer again. A lot of deer problems out there. 
but uh, we don't really have an answer for that. Just a uh, eight foot high electrified fence. That's the answer for mm -hmm. deer or some lead uh, treatment. <laughs> How about the, I know you like that African sunset petunia and the trilogy red petunia. Are they similar to the wave or the vista petunias? Nope. Trilogy red especially is not the waves spread and kind of vine. Trilogy red stays nice little compact dome form. African sunset, again, it's not going to be like a purple wave that goes everywhere. It's supposed to spread a little bit, but yet stay mounding. So they, they don't go as far as the waves do. Yeah, they just seem like a normal petunia, a typical like yeah. grandiflora, yeah. Yeah. whereas the waves are really kind of revolutionary in the right. way they spread. Right. Especially yeah. those tidal waves. Wow, those are powerful. Right. They right? can really overtake Silver your garden. Silver wave is wonderful. Mm -hmm. How big is, does that guara sparkle white get? The guara gets about 15 to 18 inches. So it's a good size plant. It gets e equal in the width too. So it's a bushy. It's not for a small garden. It'll really take some space. Okay, I think I got all the questions. Anybody have a last second question? Or anybody in our Fargo? We've got our, we have some people from Fargo there. Got some garden orphans here that uh, without their teacher, so if they came into our uh, to our uh, studio tonight, so welcome to them. Do you have a question, sir? Yeah, <clears throat> quick question on the impatience. Do you uh, know or do you uh, expect that the resistant ones to the mildew are available in the garden centers locally? Uh, or how many would there be available now that are resistant? Uh, the bounce series should be, and I've seen the bounce in Fargo here. The other one, I'm not sure. The Sun's Sun Patients, you'll have to check. Those are the only well, two then. Well, the other bounce series, I'm not sure about, but I'm assuming they must have some resistance if that one color does too. So the question had to do with was it downy mildew we're concerned about with the impatience? Was mm -hmm. that the, the new emerging? Yep. Uh, fungus and the bounce series of petunias are also impatience, impatience yeah. show resistance to downy mildew. Yep. Um, what is the variety of coneflower in this picture? That's the Cheyenne spirit. And that's, that's just a one half hardy. Is that a fun. half hardy? It's supposed to be zone four, but I think the colors, yeah, I. I wouldn't say that they're fully hardy from no. my experience. Right. So, okay. Any, any last questions before we move on? Okay. Seeing none. Barb, thank you very much for brightening our night. We You're can't welcome. wait to get planting right, right away. Thank <laughs> you very much. And we're going to take a five minute break and then we're going to start talking dirty soil. Sorry, Dave, we've heard that joke a million times probably. Okay, take a five minute break, everybody.
you can throw it in there. Okay, here we go, everybody. Let's get started. We're off to a strong start tonight, and let's just keep it going. Let's talk about soil. And if you want to have a great garden this year, it all starts with your soil. The soil is the foundation of the garden. And here to teach us and give us some tips on how to manage our soil this year is Dr. David Franzen, soil specialist for NDSU. David? Okay, thanks, Tom. Yes. All right, so caring for your garden soil. So um, this is the best reference, and I think all of you have this. Did you get a copy of this? Tom, did they get a copy it was of this? All, they, it was posted on the internet for everybody to download. Okay, so evidently I'm the author of this now, which, which bothers me a little bit because it has Ron Smith's expertise splattered all through it, those of you that knew Ron. So Ron and I wrote this together uh, a number of years ago when he was still working at uh, NDSU and not talking about wine in the newspaper. And, uh, and so once he's gone, then when we republish it, then they, they want me to put my name on it without Ron because he doesn't work for us anymore. But just so you know that if you see Ron, thank him for the publication because I still have loads of stuff that comes from his experience in it. So I can't talk about everything in this in this circular, but um, if you have some burning questions about something that's in it, uh, the related to the way you garden, uh, feel free at the end. So this is what this is what a, you need for a good garden soil. You need it to be firm enough that it supports plants. You can get a soil too fluffy and the wind will blow things over. Uh, it rains and things fall over. It has to have the ability to hold water. Uh, with sand is, is good because of drainage, but too much sand is bad because there's too much drainage. But you do need good drainage. Uh, some of the issues with disease, for example, uh, are minimized uh, if you have water moving through and not just sitting around ponding and uh, allowing disease organisms to grow. And then you know, we think about roots taking up water and nutrients, but but there's also an air exchange that happens underneath the soil. Uh, so saturated soil is bad for that reason too. There's no air in a saturated soil, so the drainage is important so that there's air in some of the pore space, and that allows the roots to breathe. So all soil is made up of these things. It's made of minerals of various sizes, organic material, and then uh, about half of, the, of a good soil is, is air and water. Uh, ideally, I guess, you know, it depends on the plant, but around half of that forest space should be water and half of is air. So the way that soil people divide up the minerals is by size. And, and sand uh, is relatively large particles, and clay is the really, really small particles. And, and silt is, is the in-between. And, and we think about sand as uh, being out on some white beach somewhere where a lot of quartz around. But, but in our, our environment, in our state, some of that sand-sized particles is, is, uh, is quartz. But, but some of it are also other minerals that, that make our soils a little bit richer than they are in certain parts of the country. We have uh, potassium feldspar, for example, that uh, occurs in the sand fraction. And uh, that contains, as the, as the name goes, potassium. Uh, so a lot of our garden soils, uh, if they're not horribly sandy, uh, have a high amount of potassium already in them. So uh, if you really want to know uh, what's in your soil, the, the USDA, the NRCS, uh, has what's called a textural triangle. And it, uh, depending on how much clay and how much silt and how much sand, we have names for these things. And, and one, of the, one of the favorite crossword uh, puzzle uh, uh, soils is, is a loam, for example. And, and I think a lot of people think that a loam is a third, a third, a third, a third sand, third silt, third clay, but that's not Right. If you go to the triangle, a soil that's a third, a third, a third is a clay loam, which is really kind of a tough soil to garden with. A 
loam is a really nice soil. Excuse me. <clears throat> Spent all day out in the field. It was a pleasure. <clears throat> um, a loam has more sand than you would think of, and 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 uh, that that really helps the drainage part of of a, a loam. A loam is a very nice soil. The two the two textures probably that are easiest to to a garden in. Uh, in our areas is a sandy loam if it's not too sandy and a, and a loam soil also. So these are forgiving, they're easy to work. Uh, you don't have to beat them to death in order to get them in shape to plant. Uh, and they have good water holding capacity and they have good natural drainage. And so if, uh, if uh, you're out on some hill out by Valley City or, uh, you know, you're 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 blessed with with these nice nice soils, but many of our gardens outside of um, uh, in our metropolitan areas. I mean, these poor people in Cass here, especially those in Fargo, we have to fight these these clays all the time. But when you get outside of the major metro metropolitan areas, outside of Grand Forks and outside of Bismarck, you a lot of the soils that are out there are loams and and sometimes sandy loams when you get out to Dickinson. So outside of the mineral, the next important important component of a garden and, and something that nobody should ever overlook is, is the organic component to it. Uh, the organic component are, are things that are, um, we, we lump a lot of things into what, what the soil test, if you get a soil test that says organic matter. And, and those are things that you can still kind of recognize what the residue is. Um, hey, that's a that's a tomato stem or something, uh, and um, and then you have things that uh, you can't recognize, but but you know it's some kind of residue, and then you just have that dark material that's all changed and transformed. Uh, so all of those things are in that same pot called organic matter, and and all are all are important. Uh, the minerals by themselves don't make a soil. Uh, probably the best. Um, the best object lesson for that was when NASA brought soil back from the moon. Uh, they thought this is this is great. We'll send water up there, somehow get water. Maybe, maybe it's down deep, and then we'll add it to this soil, and uh, and and we can grow things up there, like on the Martian, you know, the growing things. And so they added water to it, and it essentially made a brick, because there wasn't anything living in it ever, and uh, and so. Uh, minerals by themselves don't make a soil. Soils are alive, and if they're not alive, they're not going to be very productive for you. You can pour all the fertilizer on you want, but it's never going to make as much as if there's actually things that are living in the soil. So a good soil is, is, is alive. There are a lot of things alive in it besides what you're planting in it, uh, and, and those, uh, those help you out. The, the requirement for nutrients is lower. The resistance to disease and, and pests is, is lower. So these are, this is just a short list, and there are many more, and I think the circular has a nice list in them. Fresh manure, if you're on the country someplace, you can use fresh manure, but I wouldn't, that's not my number one choice, and especially if you're in town, you know, getting, giving somebody's sheep or horse manure and putting it on your backyard garden, uh, your neighbors might object a little bit because it could smell uh, a little bit. The other thing is, is that fresh manure contains a lot of free ammonia, and free ammonia is toxic to seedlings and seed. Uh, so if you get the rate too high, you can, what's called burn, you can burn the plants. And so we don't want to do that. Uh, so uh, yes, it's possible, uh, but um, this is a better source, I think. If you get a hold of some compost, some composted manure, or compost in general, it's a good source of nutrients. It's slow release because the real fast transformation has already happened. Uh, if it's really good compost, meaning not just thrown into a pile somewhere and just let set, but actually turned over so you get air mixed in so that the biology in there is more aerobic, uh, that's, a better, that's a better compost. So check your source and see if they're doing it correctly. Uh, and if they're turning it over once in a while, that's probably not going to be too bad a compost. And I think, isn't somebody else talking about compost during this this thing, or am I it? Uh, I, I can't recall, Dave. <laughs> but, we, but we do have a nice circular on making compost. I so, think so. So we do have that. 
So it's a good source of that biology too. Uh, whenever you put compost in it, the compost is alive, it's been transforming. When it gets into the garden, those organisms also work and, and all of them are beneficial. So another thing that I use in mine, and Ron Smith recommended when he was a, an extension person, uh, is the, the sphagnum peat moss. And it's a renewable resource. Some people object to it, I guess, because it's farmed. But uh, it has excellent water holding capacity. It aids aeration. doesn't have any smell to it. And it's a good source, again, of biology. There, if you look at it with a little magnifying glass, uh, it doesn't have to be very powerful. But you can see that they're just little bitty pondish plants that make up all those peat moss. If you've ever gone on a hike or something in northern Minnesota, you can, you can see these bogs and you can carefully walk across them if you know if you know what the bottom's like. So this is what it looks like. A lot of ours comes from Canada, from this area, or Wisconsin. Uh, it grows in areas with really high water tables, relatively cool temperatures. Uh, and uh, what happens is people that farm these, uh, they temporarily drain these areas, and then they just skim off a few inches off the top. And that's what they use for their peat harvest that year. And they allow the, the peat bog to, to rehydrate again. Uh, they stop up the drains and let the water go, and, and then they let it grow for years and, uh, until they, they harvest a little bit again. So another, another kind of, of organic amendment that works, works kind of like peat, but it's not peat. It's... Um, it's a uh, coir, and it's derived from coconut husks. Uh, it's more difficult to work with, and but it has the same benefits of peat uh, with a similar water water holding capacity. So, uh, one of the things I learned when we moved here, we're not native natives. My accent isn't South Fargo; it's Central Illinois. And so, when we moved here 21 years ago, one of the things we found is that the gardening here is a lot different than gardening many other places. So, so those of you around Grand Forks and those of you around Botno and those of you around Fargo uh, are intimate knowledge of, of uh, these clay soils. Uh, and so one of the, uh, when, it's, when it's really dry, these soils are nice because they, they bring up water from deep depths and, and they're not particularly droughty. But uh, if they're wet, then they're, they're really horrible. They have huge drainage issues. I, um, I, did, some, I did some research uh, not too long ago and found that um, the movement of water through these clays is uh, about a third of an inch downward per day. So that's why if we get a half inch of rain that we have streets flooding. Uh, in these areas, and uh, and of course, uh, once they get wet, it takes forever to dry them out. <clears throat> so one of the things that we did after our first horrible attempt at trying to trying to garden with these soils, when we moved here, <clears throat> is the raised bed approach. <clears throat> you can amend the soil. You raise them up so that the water will flow down, uh, and um, you don't have to deal with that. One of the problems with these clay soils too is that that if you work them when they're a little bit wet, they make these little things like tennis balls and baseballs. And then, you know, you try to till them up again when it dries, and you just will give them names because you're going to see them all year. You know, Ted over there is going to move from here to here, and, and Joey's going to move from here to here, but, you know, you're never going to break them up. <clears throat> if you try to hit them with a hoe, uh, the hoe will come back and hit you in the head. So they're, they're really kind of horrible. So this... This is what I would suggest for those of you that have some drainage issues as these raised beds. And they don't have to be real fancy. These are kind of fancy, but they don't have to be fancy. All I have to do is be sturdy enough to, in order to hold the soil so it doesn't buckle and, and move out to the side. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, when we decided to do raised beds, my wife has bad knees. <clears throat> and so these are our raised beds. They're, they're 30 inches tall, and you can just bend over and plant and bend over and, and uh, weed and do whatever you want. So uh, we have five of these in our backyard right now, so we can rotate a little bit. 
Um, but it uh, it helps out uh, quite a little bit. We don't have the drainage issues that a lot of people do. So you can plant anything you want to in here. We plant. We just we planted our spinach, and this isn't this isn't this year. Ours is still on the ground, but we did plant spinach and lettuce last week in in one of these. All right. So there's just another view. All right. So I think one of the things that's overdone in the garden is is tilling it. One of the things that I've talked about so far is is the biology. And one of the really good things about uh, a well nourished and and well uh, um, you know with a lot of peat or a lot of compost is, is you get these little worms in it, and and the worms are are making the drainage, and they're and they're eating the residue, and they're creating uh, nutrients that are that are naturally available to the plants. And so, you know, a lot of people worry about uh, about the earthworms and about chemicals, and they're killing the earthworms. And then they'll go out with a rototiller, and they'll kill every last earthworm uh, down to 12 inches with their rototiller going back and forth. The greatest enemy to worms is tillage by far. If you go out in in the field, you know, out out in the field, wherever you are. And, uh, and and go to a farmer that you know that is uh, no-till, for example, and he's been no-till for a long time, 10, 20, 30, there's some out here around beach that are 40, 40 years no-till, and just put a spade in it and, and it'll come up and it'll just be full of worms. Then you go across the road to, to a, a farmer that is conventional till every year, uses a chisel plow or, you know, goes down eight, 10 inches, goes across the field two, three times, it, you're hard pressed to find one just right across the road, and the gardens are the same way. I mean, if you if you just if you think you're doing something great by tilling to 12 inches, you're really not doing anything great. So less is more. Uh, some tillage is is uh, probably uh, needed because uh, certainly gardeners don't have the same kind of tools that a long-term no-till farmer does, but. But don't go nuts. You know, two, three inches deep, that's plenty. If there's too much residue on there, you know, carry it off or and compost it. But uh, but you don't have to go if you don't have to go deep. And uh, clay soil, uh, make sure that you don't till it when it's too wet, and uh, make sure you don't till it when it's too dry. I'm not exactly sure when that is. Maybe two o'clock. Maybe you should till it at two o'clock. It's a two o'clock garden. Um, but um, don't get in a hurry. Uh, and don't wait too long, because if you wait and you do it when it's too wet, you have clods. And if you do it when it's, that should be a, dry, a D, when it's too dry, I suppose you're going to cry if you have clods. So so you're going to have clods. So shallow tillage is, is better than deep. And if you do have the clay soils, I would, and you're going to till it, I would recommend doing it in the, in the fall. Uh, because one of the things that our clay soil has is the shrink and swell characteristics. That's why basements are so expensive around here because they have to be about three times thicker than than they are anywhere else uh, because of the the shrinking and swelling. Uh, so the freezing, freezing, thawing, wetting, drying over the winter time it really, really loosens us up. Before you go in and till you know, these kind of soils or any soil around here in the springtime, uh, go out and just. Um, uh, when it's a little dryish, and uh, and and just reach down with your hand, and just see how see how friable a lot of these soils are without any tillage at all. All right. So, lastly, do I have time for this? Uh, if you make it quick. Please. Okay. But they have this, right? Do they have this presentation or not? They have your. They have that publication, but we can make this this whole presentation available if you'd like. Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I think there might be questions. We found that, that peppers um, grow in New Mexico really well for a reason, and that's because they like, they like heat. They love heat, especially in the root system. And so uh, my wife stumbled on this, uh, and I made her a couple. Uh, and we have pepper trees every year. We replace the soil uh, every year, but we, we have peppers that are four or five feet tall, um, and go grow to uh, so tall that uh, we, the bamboo stakes uh, won't even won't even hold them. So this is this is what they look like all made together. Uh, 
It's uh, just one of these tubs that you get at one of the big box score stores with a cut, top cut out, has a drainage hole on the side, uh, at right right at the junction where the top that I'll show you here in a minute uh, meets the place where the water. So the, it has a little fill tube, that white tube sticking up. That's how you fill it, but it's a self-watering container. So you get a you get a tub, you cut the top out, uh, you cut a little uh, angle on this uh, on this uh, PVC pipe. Uh, and you stick it in, and then you drill a whole bunch of holes uh, into the top that you cut out, and then you just wire with these little wire things you get at the, in the baggies and uh, with, with some bigger PVC pipe. And so that's what that looks, and it sets right down there, and, and you drill a hole for drainage in the bottom, and then the soil goes on top, and you fill it with water up on, up on top. So it's peppers, love them. Tomatoes, eh, but... If you want peppers, man, we get hundreds of peppers off these things. So this is my soil mix, and I got this soil mix from Ron Smith, so it's not my big idea, but it's Ron's big idea, and it's worked for me in these high clay soils. I use a third volume of high clay soil. I use a third volume of kids' play sand, a third volume of sphagnum and peat moss, and then the peat moss rots um, over the years, and so you need to replenish it every year or two and then mix it thoroughly before you before you're planting the first time because you don't want you don't want a layer of clay and a layer of sand and you know so it takes a little bit of elbow grease to get it all mixed up the first time and then you're set all right so why don't we do questions okay let's do some questions um you talked about this a, a little bit but is it a good idea to rotor till a garden every year or does that hurt the organic matter well, I, I, if um, you, you have to look at what the what you're seeding, for one thing, uh, you have to look at you have to consider how you're going to plant it. I mean, people with bigger gardens have these little sometimes have these little one row planters or the planter behind it. So if the residue is going to have a give a problem with that build up, uh, then then rototilling is probably a, a, a good idea. If you're just a home, you know, if you have small gardens. And, uh, and you're planting things by hand, then the residue isn't your enemy anymore. And so you can leave some, and that's fine. Um, but however you do it, except for the very first time, if you were going to make your soil and you had to mix that whole thing, then, of course, you'd have to rototill deep. But then after that, then, you know, the top couple inches is enough. You know, what do you think about no-till gardening? That's becoming more popular now. Well, I'm a I'm a huge no-till fan. So um, if it's possible for somebody to do that, then I think that would be a great thing. And and the reason is uh, because of that biological component. Because if you, especially if you're if you have to rototill deeper than a couple inches, then a lot of that biology you just destroy, and you're and you kind of back to square one again. So if you can avoid, uh, no-till could even mean rototilling the cop top couple inches because then you still have the biology underneath there. I think it could be. Okay, you're pretty liberal on your no-till. Well, I am okay. because I've, you know, That's I've... low-till or high-till. Well, Not what I, I consider that what farmers call oh. one-pass seeding. I see. And I see the same benefits in a one-pass seeding farm that I do in a purest no-till farm. So the biology that you're mixing up in the top couple inches is, uh, is, not, um, is not destroyed. Yeah, we're going to have to have a talk one year about no-till gardening and how people plant using their pizza cutter to make their row in the soil. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, that. Dave, do you have a comment about cover crop use in a home garden? Yeah, let me see. Cover crop use home garden, would that be a good thing or not? If if you had soils that had wetness, let's say, then uh, a cover crop after, after some of the early crops would help dry that out naturally without having to put some pipes and pumps and things like that in it. If, um, if you're in some kind of raised bed situation, then I don't think that's necessary at all. Or if the drainage in the in the plot of land is is good anyway uh, I don't 
I don't see where that would be all that helpful. How helpful is lime in the garden? Yeah, so, so um, let me see. Contrary to popular beliefs, there are, uh, is a wide range of acidity or basicity or pH uh, in the state that from following the Missouri River, uh, north-south through Bismarck, up through Renville County, Mohall, that area is pretty acid. Lots of acid soils out that way. And even within areas that we normally consider fairly high pH, uh, Carrington, uh, Fargo, Grand Forks, there are inclusions of lower pH. And the, the more intensely we garden and the more intensely we fertilize, either organically with uh, anything containing natural ammonia or with um, ammoniated um, uh, synthetic fertilizers, it doesn't matter, chemistry is the same, uh, you, the net result of that is, is acidity. And so if you have pHs over 7, you would never lime. If you have pHs under 7, I think I wouldn't get too excited about it until it got close to 6. But when it started getting close to 6 or certainly below, then, then it's time to apply some lime. So you really need to have a soil test done to find out what your pH is. Yeah, you really do. The soil test is very important for figuring that out. It's a cheap test to do. Is uh, How often should we get our soil tested? Uh, I think uh, once every four years, certainly. Right. Um, yeah, I think uh, once every four years. Uh, if um, And that's uh, just for the phosphorus, potassium, those kind of things. If, if you're going to have a big patch of sweet corn, for example, or a big patch of tomatoes someplace, uh, then I think uh, before, those, before those crops, a nitrogen test, to give you some kind of clue with that, uh, you don't want to. You don't want to go into a nitrogen deficient system with either one of those, and you certainly don't want to put nitrogen on if the levels are already high, especially in tomatoes. You get this big viney thing that maybe <coughs> maybe flowers and maybe doesn't. How about, uh, do you have a comment about the use of gypsum in gardens? Yeah, so we do have some soils in the state that have a sodium problem. Uh, there are a number of different areas around the state. Uh, Leonard, um, down around the, the Maple River, uh, down in Lamar County, uh, up in the very northwest in Bowman, or not Bowman, but Burke and yeah, Divide, Divide counties up in there. And then lots of little inclusions everywhere else. And, and these, these truly are two o'clock soils because when you have sodium dominating the system, it's either too dry or too wet. And maybe you got two minutes during the season where it's just right. And so if you have some drainage, and uh, it doesn't work without the drainage, but if there, you have some drainage and you can till this stuff in, some gypsum will help to replace the sodium and, and uh, improve the soil. But if you really don't have sodium, then the gypsum itself for the purported tilt benefits, I've, I haven't seen it. I've yeah. done some testing out here. I just don't get it. How about, you know, you had a nice recipe there for your pepper planters. Would that work for any type of container gardening? One-third peat moss, one-third play sand, one-third topsoil? Yeah, so with, the, with, with those... Um, I probably put that in the wrong place. So that, that third, third, third mix, I use those for the raised beds. Okay. Okay, for, for the, for the self-watering containers, uh, I go out to my local store and I get the miracle Grow garden potting soil. Potting soil mix, that's the best. <laughs> no, the, the garden soil, not the potting soil. It's a little, potting oh, soil is a little bit soil. too loose for it. I use the garden okay. soil. Okay, Dave, so like every time you give a talk about your peppers, people uh, freak out about it and they love it. So when are you ever going to publish a paper about how to grow peppers in North Dakota? 
Well, it's the first are request like the, I've ever like had. You are guru of <laughs> Pepper. I'm serious. <laughs> I have you at events before, and people would talk to you for hours after your presentation, trying to tap your wisdom. So again, we have to just reinforce. I got. I'm get. I'm getting the comments here again tonight. People want to know about this Pepper technique you got going on. So I'm just gonna. Okay. I'm just gonna keep banging on you just okay. until you Well, finally, I don't have 31 sites from here to Montana. When you got year, nothing so. else to do. So yeah. maybe maybe I'll be bored one day. There you go. Let's put it together. I think you got a public there just wetting their appetite. <laughs> just can't wait for peppers. <laughs> Does anybody in Fargo have any questions for us? Okay. Any other questions about soil before we move on? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Dave, very much for the presentation. We yeah, enjoyed you're it. Welcome. Thank you. And we're going to take a five minute break again and we're going to start talking about growing grapes in North Dakota. Five minutes.
Okay, here we go. <clears throat> well, here. Okay, here we go. Ready to go. Onward, talk about grapes. And Harleen, do you know that grapes have been cultivated since the beginning of civilization? Yeah, I ha I could have put some pictures in Did where really? they, they, you know, have them drawn on caves and everything like that. So way before. Really? Yeah. Prehistoric times, huh? Well. Almost, mm -hmm. huh? But you see, then the humans wandered into North Dakota, <laughs> and they learned, wow, it's hard to grow grapes here. Domesticated grapes, tough. I mean, weren't we the last state to have a winery? Yeah. So, but so it's we cool. did have yeah. uh, actually a grape breeding program before the prohibition, and before prohibition. So. Okay, but not, and now it's coming back. Not prohibition, that is, but it's breeding, <laughs> and so. It's hard to grow grapes here in North Dakota, but Harleen Hatterman Valenti is our high value crop specialist. She mm -hmm. enjoys a challenge. Yeah. And she is here to share with us her tips on growing grapes in North Dakota. Harleen. Okay. Well, great. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to talk about grapes. And, uh, you know, we're not growing a Merlot, although I have heard with global warming and climate change who knows this could be the next napa but uh, probably not in my lifetime so with that so what are we going to accomplish tonight well hopefully i'm going to suggest some grapes that are hardy for this area that will overwinter in north dakota um, we're going to look at some of the cultural practices that uh, you will be using to help sustain these grapes so that they thrive and um, you know with some of this information, you know, really what you want to do is have that, uh, those grapes ripen um, before you pick them and uh, so that they're at their maximum quality. 
and that can occur you know, even in the short growing season that we have. I guess I should be looking that way. I keep looking at the audience this way. <laughs> I know. Um, in the short growing season that we have here in North Dakota. Um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, we'll have very many um, happy gro grape growers in North Dakota. So, Slight selection is, is probably key. Unfortunately, you know, most people, they're set with what the land they have and the topography they have. And so site selection goes right out the window because they go, hey, this is what I have. Now let me work with it. But if we were to go and look for a site where we wanted to put grapes, we'd want to have that slope so that cold air, and we know we get cold air, will drain down and um, and we would have our grapes up higher so that they're not down into that minus 25 cold air area. Um, they're up higher. Um, also, you see on this uh, picture where you, know, you can have problems where you could have a tree that actually goes and in, instead of letting that cold air flow down, um, it kind of puts a roadblock in and kind of brings things, stops it there. And you could also have some problems that way. So you see where we would love to have our vineyard. Now we know um, for a lot of the state, it's flat as a pancake, that's not even possible. <laughs> so, um, wind. I'm not sure anyone really realized that, you know, with calm conditioner conditions, you do have warmer temperatures. And grapes love heat. And so if you can go and get that 18 degrees higher on your leaves, um, you're going to have more photosynthesis going on. If you can get that temperature on those grapes, um, the whole process of uh, maturation and um, acidity and like that, it, it's all just um, in relationship to heat. And so having heat on there is, is important. Now, I'm not saying some breeze isn't good because uh, we all know about diseases and if you have an area where you um, have moisture on the leaves and you don't have any kind of a breeze to kind of evaporate that moisture you're going to have a lot more problems with some diseases and grapes are not uh, immune to two degrees uh, to diseases excuse me and so something like black rot can be a real problem so um, so you want something, you know, a little bit in between. Of course, you don't want something like this uh, where, you know, you can't even stand up into the wind. Um, soil. Optimum is in that soil pH of 6 to 6.8. Um, if you had a grape cultivar that was more, uh, has a background, more of the Concord grape or um, Vitus labrusca, then, um, it likes an acidic range. Uh, Vitus labrusca is more uh, native to that eastern north, um, eastern U.S., and so it's more acidic in those areas. So then, if we had soils that were in um, that six point eight seven seven two, we're going to go and see something like iron chlorosis occur. And some examples there you see is bluebell. And ES, if you ever see anything um, with the abbreviations ES, that means Elmer Swenson. He was a private breeder and uh, pretty much uh, worked his entire life on breeding cold hardy grapes in uh, Wisconsin. And Louis Swenson is one of uh, his uh, grape cultivars. And that one also um, likes, uh, has a lot of uh, Labrusca in its background, as does ES5471 which is a white grape, really nice big berries, which is another thing with uh, Vitus labrusca. Uh, um, fertility, um, we, if you think about where you see grapes growing in, in Europe and California, it's always on these mountainous hillsides, very rocky and, and like that. And uh, you know, so grapes are well adapted to rather poor soils. And so usually in North Dakota, our problem is we put them in locations where we have too much fertility 
and they're very vigorous in the first place. And so then you really get a lot of growth. And with, grow, uh, with growth, then you, you know, all that lush growth, then you get diseases. But also you think about excessive growth and shading, and that's not um, good for bud fruitfulness and ripening. And so that's why you see processes as leaf removal occurring. So what types of grapes do we um, want to grow? I think uh, has a lot to do with what you're going to go and be putting in the ground. If you're looking at just something for juice or, or jam and jelly, those are the easiest ones. And you, know, um, you can probably use a, a lot of different ones, almost anything. Uh, if you're trying to grow table grapes, a, l a little bit more difficult. Uh, because first of all, there's not too many cultivars that are hardy that are um, seedless. And, and so, and who wants seeds in their table grapes anymore? I don't really see too many going, hey, I love those three seeds I had in that last grape I just chewed on. Um, and then the wine grapes, probably even more difficult um, to grow because of the fact that um, there's a lot of um, quality and characteristics and um, that you need to uh, meet for a winery or to make that um, grape juice into wine. And so um, fewer cultivars are going to be ideal for, for um, winemaking. <clears throat> Low temperature tolerance. Um, you know, um, if you went to a website and you looked at uh, what zone there uh, many of these cultivars in, I think you'd probably see a lot of them that will say zone five and, and six and seven. And if you went to something like AA Vineyards out of New York, uh, they will have, you could sort by um, actually uh, your zone, hardiness zone. And so if you put in zone six, you'll get a whole bunch, you know, three pages worth. And then you put down five and you'll get two pages. You put down four, you got a half page. And you put down three and you probably get two vines or two cultivars that are actually hardy to a um, zone um, three. And so um, in, in Fargo, a lot of times we also talk about um, length of the growing season or growing degree. Um, and um, that we need to go and ripen these and the amount of heat or um, growing degree days to go and ripen these grapes. And so we, we have here on growing degree days, just to show you Fargo versus Williston, where we think, oh gosh, this should be really extreme, but it isn't that extreme when you look at growing degree days. Um, Frost-free days, yes, we got a few, um, a little bit more advantage in Fargo, but Again, not that extreme, um, but what happens is our, our cold hardiness zones are, are different um, because a lot of times what happens in Williston is that we don't get enough snow cover um, for that insulation. And uh, we have, um, you know, if we looked at overall how cold it gets, I think throughout the whole state, we probably do get minus 30 quite often. But maybe up in Williston, we'll get to minus 30 a few more times and we will see that in, in the Fargo area. Well, here we are, cultivars. And I think that's a pretty good list there, Tom, considering we can't grow grapes in North Dakota. Um, Valiant, actually, we use that as our standard. Um, it was a, a cultivar that was introduced from South Dakota State and Dr. Peterson. Um, actually came through North Dakota and into Montana and collected Vitus riparia, which is our native uh, grape or river grape uh, that grows natively in this area. And he uh, went and crossed that with Fredonia. I don't know why, but you know, he did. Um, he was trying to get a table grape. And so um, the berries are not the largest, but it definitely is a very hardy cultivar. Uh, it's a, a dark uh, red berry, uh, and you can go and make it. I have seen people make it into wine, but it really doesn't have the tannins and a lot of those characteristics that are uh, needed for a good wine gra uh, grape wine or grape for wine. Um, King of the North. Uh, 
And I kind of, that is another one. We've had a variety trial out at um, the Absaraca uh, Research Arboretum and, and Research Site in which um, King of the North and Valiant are probably our two hardiest ones. The only thing about King of the North is it, it has um, very high acidity, but if you're making it into a, a jam or a jelly, you know, sweetness and acidity do a wonderful way of balancing each other out and, and give that just what you kind of need. So um, I think King of the North would be excellent for something like that. Bluebell, it's one of those I said with the with the pH and so Somerset seedless. We call it somewhat seedless because sometimes you'll get little seed remnants in, um, in those grapes, which if you were to dry these grapes and making them to raisins, oh my gosh, you would never go and buy another raisin again because there's so much flavor in if you made these into your own raisins in comparison to the store um, raisins, which, you know, are just something like a Thompson seedless, which doesn't have a lot of flavor to it. So um, off on a tangent there. Um, the next ones are some University of Minnesota introductions, the Frontenac, uh, Frontenac Gris and Frontenac Blanc. Uh, Gris and Blanc are just sports off of Frontenac. Again, uh, I would say those are the hardiest of the uh, wine grapes that we have uh, tested for the last nine years. Um, in North Dakota. Uh, next um, are some other ones for wine. And I think they, as we go down, the only one that I would say could jump up there with Frontenac Gris would be Alpenglow, which we found to be um, very hardy. Marquette is a University of Minnesota wine grape that has received a lot of recognition for a good uh, dry red wine. Um, but what we found is that it really has some questionable hardiness. And Petite Pearl is an introduction from Tom Plocker, um, another private breeder in Minnesota, or actually he's Hugo and um, Minnesota. And so, uh, who is really working on cold hardy grapes as well. And St. Croix was an earlier introduction, not very hardy or marginal, I shouldn't say not very. Um, we've been evaluating a number of uh, num uh, just numbered selections, advanced selections from the University of Minnesota. Uh, the most recent introduction is MN1285, or it, they're calling it Itasca, and it's a white grape for wine um, that they're supposed to be able to make into a dry um, Chardonnay type. Um, there's a lot of a number of private breeders. Uh, DM is for Dave McGregor, uh, Elmer Swenson, who has you know passed away, but there's still lots of material of his stuff. And then TP is Terry Plocker or Tom Plocker, excuse me. And just recently, this last year, he released two more: um, Verona and Crimson Pearl. Crimson Pearl is actually a sister to Petite Pearl, and so and we've been trialing these not enough, I think, yet in, in North Dakota to know really how how they will work into the system. Okay, I kind of went and um, went over all of those that I, I think are hardy for North Dakota, but there's all kinds of grapes, as Tom said. I mean, they've, they were here at the, you know, early times with the Egyptians and like that. So what would you try in North Dakota? Well, you know, the Egyptians had Vitus vinifera. Vitus vinifera is a true wine grape, and that is native to the Mediterranean area. Um, we definitely don't have the Mediterranean areas here, so don't try to grow a Vitus vinifera grape here. It will not work um, unless you are really ready to go and put them into your basement, heat that, and do a lot of work. Um, there are French hybrids. Marshall Foch is one. Again, I, we've looked at a number of these and we think they have questionable hardiness. Only in very unique situations where you have a, a microclimate can you get away with something like that. Um, New York uh, Agriculture Extension Station, Experiment Station I should say, has a number of cultivars. Bruce Rausch has introduced a num number of cultivars. The hardiest one is probably GR7. Um, which we have been trialing 
and it's it's not that great for for here so and so here's some other ones um, that we know aren't going to be hardy enough so you might hear how Nebraska had an excellent um, Edelweiss wine it's kind of a um, you know and, but we find that we can't grow Edelweiss here and that's an Elmer Swenson introduction as well so um, planting we're going to go through this really quick um, you know you would go and generally make your order in the fall don't wait until May to go and say geez I think I want to go and order something if you're going for um, more than two or three if you're just going to go and put in two or three you can probably go to a box store or a garden center and be able to go in and get two or three um, you want to go and if you could go and get these from a nursery, there's a number of nurseries in Minnesota. You can go and order three to how many um, on that. You would get those as dormant uh, cuttings uh, or dormant rootstock in which you have all the roots and you have a stem about like this. You might have several branches on it and you would plant that um, after the, your frost is over. Um, I have seen you can get green plants. Of course, if you went to a garden center, you're probably going to get a, a plant that's in a, a pot and growing. And But again, wait until the frost is, um, chances of frost is over. You can see all the dimensions and how much room. They really take a lot of room. They like to grow. I've seen stems get 15 foot long, so you got to give them a lot of room. You'd go and um, construct your trellis. And there's um, your first year, let it grow. Don't make sure you pull off any kind of fruit that there might um, occur because the first year you're, you're building your foundation. So it's like building a house. You wouldn't go and put in the windows um, when you don't even have the foundation built. So, or put on the roof and you don't have your walls. So get that foundation. If you see any flowers, don't let them, um, uh, go and mature into, you know, any kind of fruit or form any fruit. Pick them off as early as possible because if you let that um, go on, it's just taking away food reserves for that root system and for that plant to get established. By the third year, second year, maybe you can go and keep a couple clusters on a plant, not a whole bunch. Um, and then by the third year, you can, you can probably, it's established and you can go and, and grow it as you would. Um, just going and talking about the, that a little bit more. Tre trellis material, I think for a backyard situation, um, you, you got to go and find some way to go and support these grapes. They, they love to in, in, you know, nature, they just want to, they find some shrub and they just crawl all over it. So you're going to have to find some way to go and support it because they can't, they're not like a tree, they are woody, but they can't support themselves. So a trellis is the easiest way to go and make picking fruit because otherwise they're going to climb up your tree and they're going to be up there 15, 20 foot and you're not going to be able to go and get any of the fruit. Uh, so set it up a trellis. There's a number of different trellises that you can go, at, or training systems, same thing, um, that will help with other factors as far as making ease of picking, such as um, growth habit. Some of them like to grow upward. Some of them like to go all over. Um, and what we do as um, viticulturists is by bending stems down or canes down we actually devigorize and so it's called combing them and so a lot of times what we would recommend is a high wire trellis to go and kind of take away that vigor if the canes are going upward that's the most vigor and so you're going to get a lot more growth training systems probably the most traditional one is the forearm niffin which I really don't like um, because those two arms that are coming out in at that mid wire get shaded. You're going to have all this growth and then you're going to have the grapes on the top wire uh, ripening before the ones on the bottom wire 
and it just it makes things a mess. If you're going to go and do something, I generally recommend the high wire renewal system, which is shown here, in which you, you're growing a trunk upward. You have that at five or six foot, you have that wire, and you grow a cordon on both directions, which is just a kind of like a more permanent branch, let's put it that way. Um, and then you prune so that um, every spring, you can just prune all things off, and you want to leave, usually, you want to leave about 30 buds per vine. Um, unless you have something really going fast. And the reason why you want to prune back, and so 85, 90% of what you, you'll take off of that plant. And you do that because the most fruitful wood is the second year old wood. Buds are formed the year before, and that is what is going to flower and produce your fruit. And so if you have three year old wood, it's less fruitful. You have four, you have five you pretty much will just get veg vegetative growth. And so you don't want to have this huge mound growing because it's only those uh, very tips that are going to be the most fruitful. Here's an example of the high wire cordon. Um, some people like this vertical shoot, but again, you're on that one, you're, there's a whole bunch of wires and you're forcing everything to grow upward. And, um, and then you have at about three foot, Two and a half foot, you have all your fruit. Um, another thing is if you have raccoons, it's just perfect. They can do a little pull up and just keep eating, eating, eating. So um, we found that um, for us, the VSP is more of a raccoon feeder than anything else. Um, but, and there's a picture of the vertical shoot positioning. A Geneva Devil Curtain, I think this is probably what I would suggest for a backyard in which, oh, got ahead of myself there. Um, basically, you're, you're making like a clothes wire in which you got uh, a, a piece that will divide and you have two lines. And so you're having two curtains that, and, and consider it two high wire cordons. And you can do a lot of different things. Here you see that they have went and they had one go left and right. You could go and have it longer. Um, and, and what it does is, um, I've seen it where they've had one on one side and one branch on the other side. And this is what I think would be best for a, uh, the backyard. Here you can kind of see the trunk is in the middle and then they have one of the branches going to one side and the other branch going to the other side. And then it'll go either left or right and you fill in this whole side on both wires. And we've, we've tested this and all of the um, cold hardy cultivars that we're using do just fine with this. So you end up having a lot more fruit um, and because you have twice as much uh, cordon area. Um, ah, boy, looking at the time, pruning. <laughs> okay, well, so I said we want we have to prune every spring about 85, 90 percent of the, of uh, last year's growth, um, and get back to about 30 buds. If you are in a Geneva double curtain, you'll probably have about um, 50 buds on that uh, once it's established because you're going to have twice as much cordon length. Um, and and we're doing this because we're trying to have balanced pruning. We're trying to keep crop production in balance with all the vegetative growth. And if we do that, um, then we get uh, our ripening occurs correctly and we don't have too much shading from all the growth and like that. So, it, and it's a great way of mani mani managing um, the architecture. So with balanced pruning, generally you want a I have here a 10 to 12 uh, ratio of yield to what you would prune. And a lot of people don't like to weigh. We weigh everything that we prune in the spring and we figure out and we collect, we keep records on how much fruit we get from each vine and, and we go and, and try to figure out where we are in this ratio. But basically you want about 10 pounds of fruit for every pound of 
prunings that you would take off of it in the spring. Now that can vary if you uh, wait too long and you get bud bursts, that you got a lot of water weight in those cuttings. And, and so you'll have to go and accommodate. Likewise, yeah, you don't, you only use that one year old wood that you would weigh. Um, because if you had a trunk that died, you would not go and cut that off and, and use that in your weighing. That would throw things off. Neither would you go and um, use second year old, or it'd be more like third year old wood. So um, what I've shown here though, is the two different ways of, the top one is an example of cordon pruning, in which you have um, those two semi-permanent branches that go across. And then you'll go and do spur pruning and you'll have these various spurs that you have two or three buds on each of those. They're at a node and you will not count that basal area because you'll have probably some buds that will break down there, but you'll count just the prominent buds on those spurs. And this, the bottom one is called cane pruning in which you're just saving last year one cane on both ways, and that will become then um, your, your cordon in a way. But come next year, you're gonna go and remove those. Not too many people use that cane pruning because it takes a lot more work, um, and it's not as quick because these vines kind of like, even when you do all this combing, they like to really get messy. Uh, and you're going to have to pick the best cane on each side, so it takes a little bit more work. A lot of people like to use the spur pruning and the two cordons because you can you can do something really quick and and leave them long, and then come back, start counting, and and really go and prune it up um, nicer to the number of buds you need, but really quickly. Um, some characteristics and I think what I would like to do is actually like if you could post this as well um, because there's a lot of information here to go and um, try to absorb. So that shoot density where I'm talking about you want three to five shoots per foot of canopy, that's like saying you want three to five bu buds per foot of, of uh, canopy. Um, because each one of those buds that breaks will go and give you a shoot. And if you have higher values, then again, you're gonna have a lot more shading going on and, and um, it's gonna end up being more vigorous with shoot growth, not into the, the fruit production. Um, one thing I have noticed is shoot length. Uh, so you should have 15 to 20 nodes um, really, a cluster, to ripen a cluster, you need about 12 leaves. So um, I've seen people go and prune things back, and if you don't have enough leaves, then you're not going to get enough nutrition and nutrients to those leaves, or to those clusters. So you need at least 12. And I have seen where they've gone and pruned things back to go and clean it up, and they've cut off you know, to six leaves only on a shoot. And they had two clusters there. Well, there isn't enough um, food and nutrients being produced by those leaves to support maturing those two clusters. Um, I think I'm gonna go past on, on most of these others. Again, you know, it talks about here, I have it down to individual plants more than, you know, what we're using a lot of times is um, on, on, well, yeah. There are some other management practices that we also need, we could do. Um, so if we do see that we have too much uh, canopy, we can try to get the, the clusters more exposed and it's called shoot thinning or leaf removal. Um, you don't see this occurring too often. We had seen that there actually was an advantage um, with ripening of Marquette with some leaf removal. Um, but if you went and had balanced pruning, you shouldn't have to do a lot of shoot thinning. Uh, shoot thinning occurs when you get a lot of pruning out there and then you get a lot of laterals that will shoot off. And so, and all those will do is put out leaves and shoots and, and so, and, and it gets really messy really quick. Uh, 
The last little bit, I want to go and talk about some other problems that, um, as a homeowner, I think you're definitely going to see. Um, and the first one is herbicide injury in 2,4-D. And grapes are extremely sensitive to these plant growth regulators. And in a backyard where you have uh, a turf grass, a lot of times you have dandelions and people control their dandelions and they use these plant growth regulators like a 2,4-D. And so, and this is what happens. Um, we, um, we've seen this on our grapes out at Absarac and we haven't seen, you know, a lot of times we thought it was associated because there's a wheat field, you know, um, to the west. But, you know, the last three years, we, we have had only corn and soybeans, and we still see this. And so um, there's just, and especially when it gets in your um, hot months where you get temperatures above 85 degrees and someone's out there trying to go and have this perfect lawn that you'll see some fanning occur. Now, usually it isn't severe enough that it causes problems. Um, it doesn't take very much uh, 2,4-D to go and cause some kind of these symptoms. And hopefully you'll see your plants outgrow those. But um, it's a strapping of the leaves uh, that you'll generally see with, with a 2,4-D. If you have some uh, something like dicamba or that banville in, in a mix, you'll see more cupping. Um, clopyrrolid, which is in some mixes, that can really cup things up. You have a little teacup almost um, from the cupping of these leaves. So, um, birds. I have, I have some June berries in my backyard. I have had those for 15 years. I have not gotten a berry off of them yet because um, I have, they don't even let them start to get red there, you know, and they're picking them off, let alone purple. Same thing's gonna happen with your grapes. Um, these birds are extremely smart and they're not colorblind, I don't think. <laughs> Although I have seen that they really like purples. Um, they don't go for the whites as quickly um, as a dark grape, but they will go for them. And so you need to go and get some kind of bird netting if you want to keep your grapes. Um, and you have to enclose, you can't just drape that over. You have to enclose it underneath because they're smart enough. They'll go and they'll fly up and then they'll just hop around and they'll get to your grapes after all. So um, this is a high wire and we, you can see we have the netting over it and then underneath we've clipped it together to go and eliminate the, the birds from uh, getting to them. We actually now have this high, uh, we put it about eight foot, um, three foot higher than, or nine foot, um, no, 10, yeah, it's probably nine foot, uh, about three foot higher than we have our uh, high wire and we dome the whole thing and then we can work in there because we're collecting fruit on a weekly basis when it's starting to get ripe. And so we find that work to work. But for a, a homeowner, I think you just get a netting section that you can go and just um, net your three, four, whatever um, plants. Um, I kind of talked a little bit about uh, raccoons. We also found that rabbits really in the winter love to chew on stems and can really cause a lot of problem. Deer, of course, uh, love grapes, and so uh, we have this fence uh, because we do have deer problems otherwise. And so these you have to be aware of. Maybe in town you won't have the raccoons and deer as much, but rabbits you definitely will have. And so with that, um, any questions? Yeah, so let's have all your, let's have your questions out there and we'll get you started right away. Harleen, have you had any success starting new plants with cuttings from pruning? Excellent. Is that legal? That is, that is legal if it was an Elmer Swenson. Okay. Um, and uh, usually on uh, the University of Minnesota cultivars, they have royalties that uh, the nurseries are paying. And so, but if, if you say you bought five Frontenac 
and one died or two died, uh, you could go in and prune to go and replace those two from that um, one of your front necks that is live. <laughs> the great police are out there. Huh? Yeah. Be careful. Um, how about a valiant or a king um, of the north? Yeah. Um, I Would those cuttings work? Just pruning cuttings? Why right. Not, right? Mm -hmm. They'd work just fine. Yes. Yeah, and the, the biggest thing with, uh, so if you were to do some dormant pruning, is make sure you know which end is the end, mm -hmm. uh, and so you don't put them upside down. So when we are making cuttings, and, and I mean, this is how you vegetatively um, uh, um, cultivate these, and uh, we clip the bottom straight, and the top we put a diagonal so that we know which end is up. Um, and then we'll try to get three nodes and um, really a planting growth hormone doesn't, it probably would hinder more than it helps. You don't really need anything. Um, what we do know is that it's best if you had bottom heat, but keeping those two nodes that are above uh, the, your soil or sand mixture, whatever you're using, um, cool, because you want f root formation to start and not. Um, but we've gone and we've put a bunch of uh, of these cuttings into like just plain perlite and on a heating pad in a growth chamber with some cool temp air temperatures. And yes, you can go and get them to re rather relatively easily. So. And just as a sidebar here, yeah, there's a question, can you propagate if it's not to be sold? That's kind of what we were talking about yeah. earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think if you're going to be prop, if you're going to be selling, Definitely. Sure, that's a whole different yeah. ball game yeah. here. We're just, yeah. Yeah, I, and be I was careful there. Yeah, we're just, I was we're just talking, talking about, about backyard. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But any of the Elmer Swenson stuff, you can. It's up for grabs. Mm -hmm. How about mulching? For weed control and moisture retention? Yes. And we're actually um, doing some studies in which we're looking at various mulches for weed control. And weed control, the most important time is like during establishment. After, you know, just like your tree or a shrub, after it's well established, you know, the competition by with some weeds probably isn't as bad. Um, and so we found that... Um, like a landscape fabric is probably one of our better ones in which it allows that moisture through. Um, everyone had thought that with that black, it really heat up, but there's that air layer in between. And so we really don't see that temperature of the soil heat up as much as if you had bare soil. Um, we've also seen that with using a, a straw that you're going to go and have some nitrogen depletion um, from the microbial activity, so you have to go and be aware of that. But I think mulching is a, is a good way of uh, uh, controlling your weeds and, mm -hmm. and being able to go and work around them. How do you irrigate your grapes? Is there a certain system that you use? Or? Well, okay, so for irrigation, we haven't needed to do a lot of irrigation, but usually if you're going to go and set up irrigation, you'll want a drip um, irrigation. You don't want anything overhead because you don't want to wet those leaves. You want to get that um, water down to the root system without contacting any kind of uh, foliages and um, parts of the plant. And so you know, I suppose about an, in an inch a week, uh, your typical um, as far as the time of pruning, do you have to prune before the, stat, the sap starts to run in the spring? Excellent question. We generally do not. Um, uh, we try to wait as long as possible. If we see just the beginning of bud swell, we're out there and pruning. The longer we delay with our pruning, um, the slower the vines wake up. And so knowing that in this area, we have a lot of spring frost. We really want those grapes to stay asleep as long as possible. Um, and so when you start pruning, you know, you start to wake them up. Mm. So we delay. Now, if you do prune and you start to see the sap flowing and, and you know, that doesn't hurt anything. Okay, that's good to know. Um, 
What is the disease that causes grapes to turn black and shrivel up before they get ripe? That is called black rot. What's a good name for it? Yes, and that is probably the most prevalent disease we have in North Dakota. And Valiant is extremely susceptible to black rot. So, and to are we control just it, give up or just no? There's a, a number <laughs> of fungicides that you can apply, um, and what happens is we don't apply them early enough. You have mm -hmm. to get to them earlier. At flowering, you don't wait until you start to that you have fruit on and that they, you know. Um, so you have to make those applications early um, at flowering. Preventative protection mm -hmm. yes. against the infection and good sanitation. Good too, sanitation, I, I yes. It, right? You'll have um, inoculum with any leaves and those little mummy berries oh, have yeah, a right. lot of inoculum in them. Yep, go clean up, clean up the vineyard beforehand. Okay, here we go. It's a long question here. I have a 20-year-old grape that's taken over two sides and the top of a 10 by 10 pergola. If never pruned, just cut off some of the new shoots to get into the room. Uh, I One plant produces about three grocery bags of grapes each year. Mm -hmm. Good. Should I prune more? Or And they said they had a white mold last year. Oh, last year was a bad year for downy mildew. Okay. And so that would make sense. Um, I have seen these super grapes, in fact, in North Fargo, I think there's one in which they planted it in front of the yard and it went all the way to the back and it filled up a pergola and it was just one grape. It's probably, you know, a quarter of a mile long, actually. Um, wow. And so, you know, on a, on a super grape like that, and if when a, an arbor or a pergola or something like that, isn't the purpose of that more for shading and the environment? So. Um, it sounds like you're getting as much fruit as you want right now. Um, and I probably would just you know, prune for more aesthetics on, on that than anything else. Okay, so they don't need to prune anymore. It seems like it's working. Yeah, they got going because on. they have so much vine that, yeah. you know, you're, so they're maintaining that one year old um, mm. and it's, keeps growing over. Now, when you see a lot of these old grapes that are climbing up trees, you know, all this low area, that's old wood and you don't see any grapes there. The grapes are way up high. But with the pergola, all these new shoots are overlapping some of these really old shoots that aren't productive. So they're still um, able to go and get plenty of grapes off of it. You know, for a seedless grape, is Somerset uh, the seedless? one to choose? Is it hardy? Is it is. It, it's hardy here. It's hardy. Mm -hmm. It's the hardiest. It's the hardiest um, seedless grape. Yeah. Now, um, there is a uh, breeder in Wisconsin that is working on cold hardy seedless grapes at um, UW River Falls. River Falls, Falls yes. Okay. Well, we can look forward to some of Brian's stuff. Yeah. Um, how about, what do you... How do you protect vines during the winter? Do you do anything? Well, Preferably not, right? That's why we're looking at these that's because right. if we had to go and lay them down yeah. and cover them up, um, yeah, which you would have to do with, uh, you know, at the University of Minnesota, they have some Chardonnay planted in which they put them on this mini J system because every year, in the fall, they have to undo them, lay them down, and cover them up with soil to go and provide enough insulation to protect them um, because your soil doesn't get down to, what, 25 or so, um, and then they'll be fine. Well, that, that's a lot of work. So um, if I was to go and try to grow uh, Vitus vinifera, I'd probably have it in a big pot that I could go and bring it in the basement or something mm -hmm. like that because I definitely yeah, don't want to be digging up a whole bunch of soil and covering things up all the time. Yeah, that's like in the good old days they used to you have to take the vines off the trellis and bury them in soil and that was just insane. Yeah. And that's how like the cold hardy revolution got started was finding varieties or cultivars that we don't, don't have, have to have give to. any winter protection yeah. just because it's just too labor yeah. intensive and I kinda, unreliable. 
I kind of put it as the old garage door um, opener analogy is, you know, um, before we had garage door openers, everyone was just fine going out and getting out of their car and opening up the garage and then parking their car in the garage. Once right. we got a garage door opener, <laughs> nobody wants to go back. <laughs> and so. Yeah, or a remote control for TV. Yeah. Wow. How did we live without that before? Uh, any other questions out there um, about grapes, growing grapes? Should talk about the publication. Yeah, I think we should. We've got a brand new publication about growing grapes in North Dakota. Mm -hmm. Twenty pages, packed full of information. Yep. A lot more than I could give in mm, forty minutes. <laughs> right. So minutes. if I think people, if people are interested in growing grapes, take advantage of that new publication. Mm -hmm. And you know, you can Google it, "Growing Grapes in North Dakota," or we did post it on the Spring Fever website, you know, along with this talk. And uh, we encourage people to take advantage of that great information. Yep. Very timely. Okay, Harling, thank you very much. Great. And, thank you. And uh, we hope to get our grape vineyard started this spring. I can't wait to get going. Uh, okay, thank you, Harling. We're going to take a quick five minute break and we're going to wrap up with a very brief presentation about growing gladiolas. Quick.
Okay, how about we get started? Okay, everybody, let's get started. Let's wrap it up for tonight. And we're just gonna have a very brief uh, presentation. And my goal is to teach you to how to grow a bouquet of gladiolas. Boy, that is the, probably the easiest assignment possible. And if you fail, then I'm afraid we're gonna have to have a remedial gardening class next year for you. But it's so easy to grow gladiolas. And your county agents um, were sent samples of all kinds of gladiola varieties that you can try. And so please everybody take one of these sample bags and grow a beautiful bouquet of gladiolas that you can share with someone that you care for. Gladiolas are one of the easiest to grow, most popular, most beautiful cut flowers around. And here's how you make it happen. It first of all starts with good quality corms. Corms is a specialized type of bulb, just for botanists out there. It's a swollen stem with scales around it. And you can even, if you want to, open up your bag and see what we're talking about here. These, you know, these here are your corms. This is what you're getting. Everybody's getting 10 of these. And the thing about when you get gladiolas or almost any bulb, keep in mind that the bigger the bulb, the better. The bigger, the better. The bigger the bulb, the more food energy, the stronger vigor you can have to get started, and the more likely you're gonna have success producing an attractive flower. So the bigger, the better. For gladiolas, you wanna have bulbs that about one and a quarter inch or larger in diameter. Now you've got, hey man, you get the best from NDSU Extension. These are US number one bulbs and they average about one and a half inches. So you've got no excuse with these bulbs, they're gonna be outstanding bulbs for you. But on the other hand, if you go to the bargain store and you buy some really cheap bulbs, and if they're three quarters of an inch in diameter or smaller, you may not get any blossoms. You might just get uh, some leaves this year. So keep in mind, the bigger, the better. And then also the thing to keep in mind is you want a bulb that's plump. It should look just like a Hershey's Chocolate Kiss. That's what you want, big, fat, plump one, not a skinny, flat one. So the plump bulb is full of lots of valuable food for your plant. And then also, especially later towards springtime, you gotta be especially careful making sure that the bulbs you buy are firm and they're not soft. We don't wanna be introducing disease into our planting. Okay, bigger the better. Then where are we gonna plant our bulbs? Almost every flower demands full sun. Same with the gladiola. So we want eight hours of direct sun put it in a sunny garden area, and we have to have good drainage, okay? Otherwise, the corms will rot. So good drainage, good sun, and access to water is very important. You know, in North Dakota, this is a semi-arid state, and water is the number one limiting factor in success in gardens. So access to water can be very important, and if you're gonna water any time, the most precious time is as soon as those flower spikes start to develop. That's when the gladiolus especially needs your attention and needs a drink of water. Okay, uh, the other issue with North Dakota, my Lord, like we saw Harleen's picture of that dog with the hair flowing over. Same, that could be your gladiola too. Gladiolas, the biggest issue we have in our gladiolas trials is how they blow over from the wind. So pick a sheltered site out of the winds or then you can also stake your gladiola spikes. You can stake everyone individually or cut flower growers, they will raise gladiolas in a straight row, and then we'll pound in a stake, a two by two, every 10 feet down the row. And then we'll wrap some nylon twine around either side so we can provide some support that, that gladiola can grow within. And so when the winds come, it has some support and it won't blow over. You gotta put that support little net on as soon as possible though. Don't wait till the plant gets two feet tall. This is a big issue, so a sheltered spot's critical for success. All the gladiolas do look beautiful horizontally, as you can see in this picture, I have to say. It's beautiful anyway. Can't go wrong with gladiolas, right? Okay, as far as sowing, we had a talk earlier tonight about uh, good quality soil really makes a big difference, and for gladiolas, you know, almost every, every, every plant in the garden, it benefits from a little bit of added organic matter. And like Dave Franz, and I'm a big proponent of sphagnum peat moss, or, or rotted manure or compost, add an inch of that into your soil and work it up to improve the overall condition of the land. 
As far as fertilizer, a general recommendation is we use about, about two pounds of a balanced fertilizer, like 888 or 101010 for every 100 square feet. And usually what we do is we put about half of it down early on as a broad, broadcast treatment before we plant, and then we'll side dress the other pound. We'll split the other pound in the two halves and we'll side dress when the plants are about, oh, about 10 inches tall. And then again, as soon as the flower spike is initiated, that's another good time to get the plant's last fertilizer. But the best thing is to get a soil test report. That's the best thing. So then you can know exactly what your plant needs. As far as planting, it's too early. I know you're very excited about getting these free gladiolas, but calm down. Uh, you cannot plant them now. It's too early because look how, look how deep you're going to plant those guys. Four to six inches deep. I plant mine about four inches deep. And the ground is still very cold four inches deep. That bulb just, or that corn is just going to sit there and rot if you plant it now. So wait till at least till mid-May and maybe even late May uh, to be more assured that you'll have a, a strong stand. Um, it's not uncommon for it to take a couple weeks for your gladiolus corms to emerge out of the ground. So I encourage you to wait till the soil is warm and then be patient. And we'll plant them about four to six inches deep and make sure you don't plant it upside down. Okay, all you master gardeners out there, you know this little bump's called the sprout. That's where the top of the bulb is. That goes on the, on the top and this basal plate where the roots are, that's the bottom. But even if you just throw them in the sky and let them fall down, they'll find a way up. They'll figure it out which way to grow, but ideally plant them properly. About six to eight inches apart. Biggest pest problem we have gladiolas are thrips. And you, thrips are really small. You can't see them with the naked eye, but you can see their impacts and you'll see silvery streaks like this on the blossoms as well as on the leaves. So if you start seeing that, you gotta take action. And I'm not too crazy about using insecticides on a flowering plant because you don't wanna harm the honeybees, but there are some more bee-friendly insecticides out there like uh, pyrethrum. And the most common trade name for that is Pyganic, P-Y-Ganic, that is, you know, Pyganic. Or uh, Neem is, can do the job on thrips too. And the thing about thrips is they hang out into the, in the folds of the leaves. This is a healthy plant, but I'll just show you those tight folds, and that's where those thrips hang out. Somehow we got to get that chemical into those folds. And, you know, if nothing else... Um, when I used to work uh, at the World Vegetable Center working with the very poorest farmers, we found that even if you just uh, shoot some water in there into those folds, it can dislodge the thrip. So anything's better than nothing. If you really want to have a perfect plant, there are systemic insecticides uh, like Bear Advanced Insect Control for insect control and roses and flowers is a systemic, but that's imetacloprid and not a very bee-friendly chemical. So just be on the lookout for thrips. Thrips come with the bulbs, and but you got beautiful bulbs. You didn't get thrips, but be on the lookout, because especially if you planted glads in the, in the area in your garden in previous years, you can build up a thrip population. So be on the lookout for those silver streaks and take prompt action if you see it. Okay, let's talk about harvesting her. That's because I'm a farmer. I don't cut my bulbs or my cut my flowers, I harvest them. But when you harvest a gladiola, you cut it, when you see this on the spike, the bottom third, the blooms are fully open. The middle third of the spike, the, the florets are just partially opening. And then the top third, the, 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 the buds are just starting to show their color, just barely can see any color. That's the time you do the harvest. And you do it in the morning when the plants are turgid and sturdy. That you don't want, never want to do it in the afternoon when the plants are all are weak from that from that harsh afternoon sun. So do it in the morning, go out there with a, a clean bucket of lukewarm water and make a quick cut, slip the, the spikes right into the lukewarm water. When you make a cut, you have to leave some of the, the leaf spikes there. You got to leave the leaves there because the corn bulb, you know, I'll just tell you this, this bulb here, this is, this mother, she's gonna give all of her energy you should love her. She's going to give all her energy to produce those beautiful flowers for you. And she's going to be tapped out. And she's going to just shrivel up by the end of the year. But we want 
this mother to create a daughter bulb for the next year's gladiola. And to create that daughter bulb, she needs food energy, and she gets that food energy from her leaves. So when you make the harvest, cut the flower spike, but leave the leaf, the leaves, because that's very important for the creation of the daughter bulb. And after you make your cut, you bring the, the bucket of glads in, and then you put them in a cool, dark place for a few hours to get over their shock. And then you enjoy it. And to enjoy your glads, you're gonna give them fresh water every other day, gonna make a fresh cut every, every other day, fresh cut from the bottom, just take another inch off. Your cut flowers last longer in bright but indirect light. Don't, you don't want that harsh afternoon light on them. Keep it cool. And then use a flower preservative if you have one. Otherwise, there's some homemade recipes out there. Um, a common one is like using lemon lime soda. One part lemon lime soda to three parts water. That's one recipe. And you throw a cap full of bleach in per quart of water for the, to sterilize it, to keep the diseases out of the water solution. Another recipe is uh, you can use lemon juice, a couple tablespoons of lemon juice, a tablespoon of sugar. Mix that in the water with the cap full of bleach and you're ready to use that as your flower preservative. So just enjoy the beauty for a couple weeks. And then you start thinking about next year. And so you talk about storing the bulb for next year. We're gonna, after the frost comes, we gotta dig up that corn, cut off the stalk right away, and then we're gonna store those corms in a, in a warm, airy place for a few weeks. And after that, we're gonna do the final cleaning, get the the rough dirt off of it. The mother bulb will just scrape off. The old shriveled mother will just scrape off. You keep the husk. You want that papery husk to protect the bulb. And then we're gonna store it over winter in a cool place where it's dark and dry. And I store mine in like onion bags, like a, those nylon mesh bags. They store really nicely. So that's how you make it happen this summer, guys. I wish you all, here's my photo credits. And I also wanna Wish you good luck, good success. I expect great results and a lot of happiness from these gladiolas, so good luck with it. Does anybody have any questions out there? Well, first off, somebody was wondering, oh yeah, you come on. First off, somebody was wondering uh, where the folks in the internet, internet land could get a bag of the corms themselves. I think he was hoping you would provide them. Really? But I, well, you if you to... come to Fargo in the next 15 minutes, I'll be happy to get <laughs> you our extras. Or, hey. but if that doesn't work for you, um, you know what? I think a good way to, to do it is we test cultivars. We have a home garden variety trial program, and we test gladiola cultivars. And so if you'd like, I can't give them to you for free, but um, we're doing tests of red, yellow, orange, rose pink color glads and so for a dollar fifty i can give you like two yellow varieties that you can compare in your backyard garden and and you'll compare them side by side and then you'll make a recommendation for us like here's priscilla priscilla was a very strong performer last year in our cultivar trials and so this not only holds on with glads but we next week we'll be talking about vegetables where you can test them in your own backyard garden so you can just Google North Dakota Home Garden Variety Trials. It'll get right to our website, and we're shipping out stuff this week in a major way. So take advantage of that. And uh, if for children, we offer one free trial per child who wants to help manage a trial. So there you go. Can you repeat the homemade preservative? Preservatives? Sure. Um, there's there's a there's a lot of them out there, but two that are I'm most familiar with is you mix one part of lemon lime soda you don't use the diet stuff the real like the real seven up one part of that and three parts of water and also you throw in a little cap full of bleach just a dab of bleach there per quart and then uh, that's one option the other one is you use lemon juice about two tablespoons of that with one tablespoon of sugar mix that in a quart of water and put a little bleach in there and that will also help can you plant them in a pot and stake them? You can definitely plant them in a pot. Uh, you're gonna plant them a little bit closer. You're not gonna go six to eight inches now because every inch is precious in a pot, but maybe four to six inches. Yeah, great, containers, it's the way to go. 
And, and uh, that's the nice thing about a pot is that you can control the sun and the wind much better in a movable situation like that. So you can have great success growing them in a container. Great suggestion. That's all for us. Okay, here. any other questions out there? Fargo? You can start them now, I guess, in a container. Mm -hmm. and then, transplant them. then transplant them. That's right. There's a lot of ways to garden, that's for sure. But in general, I'm going to tell you, wait, wait, wait. Wait till mid to late May. That's the time. to. Wait. And also, you can keep planting until mid-June. But that's as late as you can plant. And sometimes people plant a little bit in, in late May, and then a week or two later, you can put another group in to have another sequence of blooms. Okay, with that, I'm going to say thank you, everybody. Enjoy your glads. And thank, I want to thank all the speakers. We had an excellent session tonight, and we have one more to go. We'll see you next Monday night here at the Spring Fever Garden Forums. See you next Monday.